<laughs> HRT. Cool. Okay, this is the last take. We're running out of time. Okay. So, from the bushfire ravaged east coast of Australia to the sundry and streets of the now? west coast, it's the second instalment of the New South Wales New South Wales ARB VTO and Friends COVID quiz. We've got a great lineup of guests tonight, and they're keen to test their esoteric knowledge of all things trees to see who will be crowned this week's COVID quiz champion. Soon we'll be meeting our guests, but first it's up to where the ships break the view of where the sky meets the sea to hear from the man that makes these happen, New South Wales. Um, Boroughculture's Sam Hardingham. Sam, since last Friday, you've been able to drop into a pub and have a drink with up to at least nine other people. And in just over a week, you'll be able to go and stay somewhere other than your own home. Tell us, what's the chatter in New South Wales as we take our first tentative first steps towards a post-COVID world? Hey, Shane. Well, I haven't ventured back to the yeah. pub yet, but I did have a chat with Luke Rajelja from Elevate Rescue in Sydney. Um, and he's got a shop at 62 Planthurst Road in Carlton. That's Carlton, Sydney. So when I spoke to him, he's been busy packing and shipping orders. And then for those of you that haven't heard of Elevate before, they were previously known as SRT, and they're famous for making their pulleys. Now, Luke designs and manufactures all the pulleys himself. His new rigging pulleys have gone from a working load limit of 80 kilonewtons to 120 now and um, when you visit his website he said earlier to ignore all the prices he's got on there phone him up and he'll make a deal that can rival some of the overseas companies so Elevate's been a good um, supporter of New South Wales Arb for a while and it was good to have a catch up with Luke earlier. You might what want to try that headwear on again without your virtual background <laughs> sound because we can't make it out. Hang on I'll try and turn it off. I'll do better than that. I'll actually just show you quickly. I've got Luke's website here. Yep. Share that screen with us. Uh, is that sharing now? Nope. No. No. Uh, host disabled participant screen sharing. Can you do things? Radio. We were meant to fix this up, weren't we? More. More. Make co-host. There you go. Try it again, Sam. Okay. How's this? Can you see his website there? No. Okay. Oh, hang on. So it sounds like we're experiencing... Oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. There we go. All right, so this is Luke's website. He gave me a bit of a rundown about it earlier. Um, he sells all the art gear, but um, you know the the Elevate gear that he makes himself is is really good. Um, I've actually got a few of his old pulleys here still still kicking. Um, but yeah, if you go on his website, um, he says he's not very good at updating the prices, but he will do you a better deal um, no, if you give so him a call. Grab his phone number, give him a call. Yeah. Hearing. Thanks, Sam. Cool. And now to our guest for tonight. For those of you that joined us last week, he's a man that needs no introduction. For those that didn't, he might be the one of the shortest men in the borough culture, but he's someone I've always looked up to. It's Trina, it's Glenn Williams. Glenn, what's going on in, hang on, someone, some cheeky person has changed this to read 1994. What it's meant to read is what's going on in South Australia. Ha! Well, I've enjoyed uh, brekkie and uh, with, with a mate this morning indoors at a cafe which is pretty fantastic. So in terms of easing of restrictions, 10 indoors, 10 out. So particular facilities can uh, hook up to 20 people now. Um, uh, and getting real live china and, and kitchen activity as opposed to takeaway taco. So things are looking up from the Adelaide Hills point of view. So we're not so um, sleepy hollow. No, basically, yeah, yeah so it's all good. Um, and while we're, I've got a moment to take a plug, uh, just this week, TreeNet uh, have confirmed that uh, our normal symposium event won't take place in its normal format in this September. We are definitely going to some sort of hybrid arrangement and a virtual program for the month of September, as I hinted at last week. Uh, and it will now be the TreeNet Urban Forest Festival. So we're hoping to sort of use the flexibility of a virtual sort of uh, option 
to uh, plug in a few more offerings than we would normally have. Now, the downside is we don't get to meet up with you wonderful people on a face-to-face -face, um, over good tucker and, uh, and food and camaraderie. But then again, you don't have to cough up for flights and accommodation this time round. And um, we reckon it's a, it's a pretty pretty fantastic program we've got. So well, of course, um, Sam yeah. and I will be sharing some of that information through our social media networks in a yeah. while. As soon, soon as I've got something, uh, you'll have it. Cool. So let's go further west to the state that highlights, bolds, and underscores the strict in border restrictions to say hello to an old friend of the VTO. He served in several roles with the Tree Guild of Western Australia over the last few decades. He was the director of the WA Tree Climbing Champions from 2004 to 2006, in, again in 2009 and 10, and 2015. And he's had a significant impact on the abara culture industry by introducing Western Australia's first international format climbing competition, weekend arbor camps and training workshops. He sat on many representative boards for abara culture. He's helped VTO run some of our events and he's currently on the practicing abara cultural committee with abara culture of Australia. Say hello to Michael Byrne. Michael, what's going on in Western Australia? Well, after that intro, mate, I've got nothing else to say. That's it. it wraps it up. What's the weather like there at the moment? Oh, beautiful, mate. Beautiful on the golf course today. Mm -hmm. How long have you guys been allowed to play golf? Oh, yeah, in groups of four as well. Yep. Yeah. Social good. distancing. We had to have our own cart, but, you know, it's a small price to pay. That means you have to carry your own beer, Michael. And open it, yep. yep. Oh, that's unusual for you. That's no good. Lucky you've got those borders locked down or we'll all be coming over for a holiday. Yeah, no, we've fixed that hole on the rabbit-proof fence as well, Glenn, so... Um... <laughs> okay, so let's head south now, and it's down to the Apple Eye where we'll catch up with a great friend of the VTO. She presented at the Cruden Farm Workshop a few years ago and is responsible for photobombing Cookie the Cockatoo into Stonington's local law and has over the years helped out with the registration of many of our events. So if you've been to one in the last few years, she's probably already ticked you off. But see if she can do it again tonight as we say hello to Rebecca James. Rebecca, so at the start of the year, you left Melbourne for a tree change just in time to join a COVID lockdown. How's life in Tassie treating you? Look, Tassie is treating me very well. My two kids that I've had to homeschool for the last two months, not so much. That said, school is going back on Monday and I think the household is absolutely and utterly delighted. Um, we're based in Lonnie, uh, which is a nice compact little city and um, there's lots of beautiful parks and open spaces that we've been availing ourselves of while doing schoolwork and um, that cooler climate is really starting to show up in autumn with a lot of those European trees just luminous in their colour. So um, it's been a softer, it's been a soft landing, but I'm looking forward to the kids going back so I can um, try and start up a consultancy practice down here. Thanks, Beck. And in the deepest, furthest recesses of my mind, Barry Manilow's Mandy is starting to get louder and louder as we make our way up north to say hello to Amanda Woodens. What's happened to you in the last two weeks, Mandy? Uh, well, with the COVID restrictions, I've gone into deep tree nerd so, um, mode. So I've been hanging out with the Vice President of the International Dendrology Society and learning about a lot of really intriguing rare maples. And then I've turned my attention to um, plants that can be used for underplanting underneath trees to great effect. So that's been entertaining me while I chill out. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, as we make our way into the quiz, um, I'm Shane Hall, I'm the president of the VTIO, and over the next little while, we'll be asking our guests a few questions that are tenuously related to trees. We'll hear from a few friends in our industry about recent going on. And later in the show, VTIO's favourite Barnsley will lead you through a Kahoot quiz where you'll be playing for your chance to win a $100 prize voucher, redeeming like cannings and attrays. Tonight, our guests are vying for their chance to win this first generation of Moody Cadell and Partners cap. Now, let's get the... Um, can we all see that at home? Yep. Yep, cool. Uh, which I think was first released at the Bendigo 2016 Victorian Tree Climbing Championships. This stylus ill-fitting hat incorporates a design factor that ensures the slightest wind pauses at the fall off your head. Um, we're all grateful that we have the new generations coming around. The next time you see James and the boy at one of our events, you get one of those new ones. Now, um, in the first part, I'll be asking some questions of our panellists and they'll do their best to answer. 
Now, points will be awarded for the most correct answer. And to explain what I mean, here's an example. The botanical name of Silver Princess is A. Oh, is. Eucalyptus is correct. Eucalyptus casea is more correct. Eucalyptus casea subspecies magna is even more correct. The most correct is Eucalyptus casea subspecies magna, rooker and hopper. But um, if we get to that level, I think I'm going to be kicking you out. First in to buzz is the answers, gets the first crack. Um, if they haven't provided the most correct answer, I'll leave it open for one more contestant. So contestants, let's check your buzzers and find out what you're drinking. Glenn, your buzzer sounds like... Didn't hear that, Glenn. Really? Yep. Oh. Um... Your buzzer sounds like... Oh, well, you might have to bring that a bit closer to the mic. And you are drinking... Um, 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 um... Now, I just want to get a, a bit of a sound check or nods from the other participants. Did you hear either of those sound effects, guys? No. No. Ooh, ooh, ah. <laughs> Here I was, thinking I'd, I'd sorted out audio problems. I'm just going to give it one more burl up close to the camera. I think you're good, Glenn. I think that's brilliant. Leave it as is. <laughs> got that. Okay, now I know what I've got to do. Thank you. No worries. Okay, Michael, your buzzer sounds <laughs> like... I'm pretty underprepared. I don't have a buzzer and I don't have a drink. I didn't realise format of the meeting. I might have to get you to put your hand up and I'll pay attention to the screen as best I can. Paul, you might have to help me out with this. Um, Beck, let's uh, sound test your brother. Yep. And what are we drinking tonight? I'm drinking a lovely local drop, a Tasmanian Devil's Corner Pinot Grigio. Beautiful. And Amanda, your buzzer and drink, please. Yep. I'm using my COVID coin jar, all the coins it is inappropriate to use at the coffee shop at this time. I'm drinking this lovely little Grenache with a Wombat on it. Yep, they sell that at my local, that's very yummy. Cool, okay, and off we go. The Virgin Suicides, released in 1999, is Sophia Capella's directorial debut and based on the Jeffrey Eugene Genetti's 1993 best-selling debut novel of the same name. The film follows the lives of the five Lisbon sisters during the late 70s and opens with the suicide of the younger sister, Cecilia. In the book, however, she survives. Regardless, what eventuates in both of them, the girls are put under close scrutiny by their parents, eventually being confined to their home for a long period of time before all eventually suiciding. Early in, it's both, in, early in both the book and the movie, it's established that the local parks department have programmed the removal of elm trees along the street on which the girls live. When the parks department set up to remove the tree in front of the Lisbon's home, the girls surround the tree and argue for its retention as it's not yet dead. One of the sisters states that there wouldn't be a problem if the bug, bugs hadn't been in, let in from Europe. The general apathy of the local community to the removal of the currently healthy trees mirrors the lack of concern towards the girls' confinement. Um, so there's a bit of mirroring on there. Now, now that I've got my quarantine question out of the way early, and I've tied it to one that highlights mental health issues, that come with isolation, which is the perfect COVID quiz question. What I want to know is, what is the disease and what is the vector? Dutch elm, Dutch elm disease, uh, elm bark beetle. Okay, I'm going to leave that open because we can have a more correct question. Answers. Well, I would have said just elm leaf beetle. Well, I might take marks off and for the, that. What's that? I might take marks off for that. Oh, shucks. All right. <laughs> Vector is lava. Are you hoping for the botanical Latin of the, of the beetle? And the, and the fungus. Oh! Do I get points because we don't have that here yet? <laughs> They haven't been able to move through the rabbit-proof fence. No. <laughs> Why didn't you think to do that in Stonington? Rightio. So, our Dutch elm disease is the disease, which is an Ophiostoma ulmi, um, which was one of the first ones recorded that later emerged into Ophiostoma novo ulmi. The elm bark beetle is Scolitis scolitis, otherwise known as the large elm beetle, um, which is a much better vector than Scolitis multistriatus. Uh, there is a, an American one, Hylogopenus rufipus. The Dutch elm disease refers to its identification in 1921 and later in the Netherlands by Dutch phytopathologist Bay Swartz and Christine Buisman, 
who worked with Professor Joanna Westerdijk. The disease affects the species in the genus Ulmus and Zalkova, and therefore it's not specific to the Dutch elm hybrid. Mm. The answer hey, was okay. as long as the question. Sorry? The answer was nearly as long as the question. Ah, oh, yep, yep. You'll find that that's pretty much the same. Now, we were going to haul here from David Hall, the physiotherapist, um, who's been to many a VTIO event over the last six years. Um, Arbor Camps. He's prepared for us a number of documents, and I'm just sharing a screen for now. So over the years, David's prepared some manual handling and stretching and exercise books, but also mental well-being for arborists. Um, and these are some documents that you can find on the VTR website if you need some literature to share with your work colleagues um, and friends um, to help you not only get your body into shape for the morning each day, but your workplace, uh, set up ergonomic workstations and work in a normal ergonomic fashion, but also get your mental health in order as we move through these tough times. So, as we slowly transition out of our COVID-19 lockdown, we can begin to look back at how we've changed over the last few months of isolation and look forward to the new us emerging into the brave new world. And in the most tenuous of segues we can, I can think of, um, we can think of our pre-selves lockdown as caterpillars who have spent their COVID lockdown as pupa getting ready to emerge into a post-COVID world as a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. I'm now, already beautiful, beautiful. Is found only in insects that undergo a complete metamorphosis. That is four life stages, e.g. egg, larga, pupa, and imago, which is the adult stage. The pupae of different groups of insects have different names, such as chrysalis for the pupae of butterflies and tumbler for those of the mosquito family. The term chrysalis is derived from the metallic gold color found on the pupae of many butterflies, referred to by the Greek term chrysos for gold, and is from the Greek chrysalis, or the plural chrysalids. Now, the chrysalids is a science fiction novel by British writer John Wyndham, first published in 1955. Um, so in a post, um, now, allowing, apart from allowing me to talk about insects for a while, why would I discuss a John Wyndham novel in a trivia question, quiz? He wrote Day of the Triffids. Bang, Michael, 10 points. Oh, get out. Whoa. Really? Hang on, he didn't use his buzzer. Oh, beep, beep. oh okay, one point off. Oh. I'm joking. Mate. I didn't see it. John Wyndham Parks Lucis Benyon Harris, born 1903, died 1969, was an English science fiction writer best known for his works published under the pen name of John Wyndham. Yes, and he did indeed write Day of the Triffids. Yeah. Now, during the time period leading up to the American Revolution, a stately tree on the Boston Commons served as a place to demonstrate dissatisfaction with British rule. On August 14, 1765, a band of discontented merchants and artisans that later became known as the Sons of Liberty hung an effigy in the tree to protest the Stamp Act. The tree became a symbol of objection to British policy, policies and became an inspiration to other communities who soon established their own liberty trees. The tree continued to serve as an important place to demonstrate opposition to British actions until it was cut down at the direction of Nathaniel Coffin Jr. in August 1775. What type of tree was it? A green one. Beep, beep. Michael. Silex. No. Okay. Oh, Josh. Um. Uh, I think Beck might have got it first. Beck? Was it a red oak? Quercus no. rubra? Amanda, one last chance. I was just going to go for shoot for genus like Mick, so I'm going to put forward uh, Quercus. Okay. Um, it was, in fact, an Ulmus Americana or American Elm. Mm. Of course. <laughs> the Liberty Tree was part of a grove of elm trees said to have been planted in 1646 by property owner and innkeeper Garrett Burns. It was described in a 1765 poem as a stately elm whose lofty branches seemed to touch the skies. Uh, Shane, yeah. yes, sir. sometimes it, it helps us to actually hear the questions if you take a breath. Okay, <laughs> so you're saying slow down a little bit. Uh, breathing is optional, mate. Don't let them coerce you. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's almost uh, past my bedtime, Shane. I'm just, you, right, know, you were saying you were drinking something, Shane, so take a drink in between the, as a pause. We'll see how this ends afterwards. Thank That's you. a good reminder. <laughs> Question four. 
In the late summer of 1666, while under a tree grown in the garden of Woolthorpe's Manor near Grantham in Lincolnshire, once sat an inspired Isaac Newton. Watching something fall from the tree, he began, Rebecca. Quercus Rover. <laughs> we might want to brush up on our story of the laws of gravity and how Isaac Newton, Amanda. Oh, was it was it was it was Sorry, Amanda. Malice. Yep. Domestica. I can't remember what that species is. Domestica. Anyone want to have a crack at that? Glenn Mick? I've got a picture of the tree, but I have, can't give you its uh, botanic uh, or botanical. Now it's um, Granny Smith. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my research says it was a Malus pumlia. Oh. So 10 points for Amanda. Not a kangaroo apple. No. No. Um, so moving on to question five. William Tickham Shay Sherman, 8th of February 1820, died 14th February 1891, was a United States Army General during the American Civil War. He is the namesake of the medium tank M4, the most widely used tank by the United States and Western Allies, and he was not in any way related to Allen. He succeeded General Ulysses S. Grant as the commander of the Western Theatre of that war in the spring of 1864 and later served as commanding general of the US Army from 1869 to 1883. Now, the largest tree by volume is known as the General Sherman tree. It's in Tulare County, California. Beep, beep. When determining the volume, only a trunk is used in its calibration. Two part question, what type of tree is it? And to the nearest 10 cubic meters, how big is it? Beep, beep. Yep, Nick. Nick. Sequoia gigantium. Mm -hmm. And oh, okay, oh, it's a sequoia dendrum gigantium. I'm going to give you 15 points for oh, that. that. Yeah, we just, oh, I just up a bit. Yeah. <laughs> You're just saving time, are you? Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, and do you want to have a crack at the uh, cubic metre of wood it holds? Oh, how many jelly beans in the jar? Um, the biggest in the world. Yes, good answer. <laughs> a really oh. heavy and you'd never pick it up. Anyone want to have a crack at that? A thousand cubic metres? Yeah, two thirds of the way there. The volume is estimated to be 1,487 cubic metres or 52,500 cubic feet. That's a lot of mulch. That's a lot of mulch. Yeah, that's a lot of mulch. <laughs> that's a lot of firewood. Now, The Little Matchstick Girl um, is a short story by Danish poet and author Hans Christian Andersen. It's the story about a die, dying child's dreams and hopes and was first published in 18. 1845. Um, it tells the story of a freezing New Year's Eve where a poor young girl, shivering and barefoot, tries to sell the matches in the street, afraid to go home because her stepfather will beat her for failing to sell any matches. She huddles in an angle between two houses and lights matches to keep herself warm before they all eventually run out and she freezes to death. Happy now, day. Um, What's with these questions? What, red, what, what wood a match is made out of? Mm. Matchstick. Poplars. Okay, we're close there. Poponius. Might, might give you five points of our players. Ooh. No idea. Redwood the matches are the most popular matches in the world and they are made out of populous tremoloides. Um, so it's most like I'll give you 10 there. points. Um, the common term for them is Aspen in North America, they use Pinus monticola. Um, so they don't use Stenocarpus? Not according to the, um, not according to their website, no. Oh, that's all right, Beck got that one. Thanks, Beck. <laughs> Question seven. In 1860, the government of Victoria, then Australia's richest state, state, decided to sponsor a lavish expedition to make the first south-north crossing of the continent of the Gulf of Carpentaria. 18 men, 20 camels and over 20 tonnes of provisions started out from Melbourne in August on their ill-fated trip led by Robert O'Hara Burke and William John Wills. The party reached Cooper Creek by December oh, and okay. after building a stockade, Burke and Wills started north along with Gray and King, the other four men remaining at the camp. They followed the Corella River into the Gulf and found vast salt marshes lay between them and the sea. Disappointed, they left the Normanton area in February 1861 and headed back south, their progress being slowed by the wet season and food starting to run out. 
On the evening of April 21, they staggered into the stock camp, which had been decamped only that morning. They tried to walk south to reach the inner Minka area, where they were fed by Aboriginals, but by September, when the rescue party had tracked them down, only King was still alive. Now, the Birkin Wills Dig Tree, located on the northern bank of Cooper Creek in Durham Downs, is one of Australia's national icons. What type of tree is it? <laughs> I think I saw Amanda move first there. I'll just have a crack. Um, Eucalyptus camaldulensis. That's a eucalyptus, so you've got 10 points. Anyone going to come in over the top? Beck? Coolabar, but I think I need to give it to Glenn because he just typed it up on the screen. <laughs> as, did, as did Beck, as did our favourite Barnsley. <laughs> yep, so... Beck, you're saying Glenn got Coolabar out before you, so he gets five points because that's the type of tree. Microtha, a eucalyptus microtha, otherwise known as a Coolabar. Um, so that's what the guy, uh, was it the swag man went under? Under the Coolabar tree. Hmm. Oh, that's sorry, Shane. That's your next question, isn't it? Somebody else dying. <laughs> okay. <laughs> question nine. Boone Hall Plantation is one of America's oldest working plantations of continually growing crops for continually growing crops for over 30, 320 years. Um, the plantation includes a large colonial revival plantation house completed in 1936 that replaced the original house, a number of cabins and flower gardens, and an historic alley, which is a traditionally a straight path or road lined with trees or large shrubs. We commenced planting in 1743 and finished in 1843. This line of trees runs for over, for over a kilometre along the drive up to the house and consists of 44 trees on each side. What type of tree have they used? Crimbia citriodora. Pevia brasiliensis. Oh. I don't even know what they are, sir. I'm guessing no, I don't know. I just no. Googled it. Um, oh, 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 spoiler alert. Okay, Southern Live Oaks or Quercus Virginiana? <laughs> now, we're moving along because a lot of our guests haven't turned up to drop in with updates. So we're probably going to make up for a lot of time. Here's our music quiz. I want to unmute that one. This song contains the common name of a tree. I want the botanical name of that tree. Uh, audio problems. any music from this century? <laughs> <laughs> I fear your quiz participants are revolting again. <laughs> in, in the nicest possible way. Don't say that about us, Amanda. We're all lovely people. You're the leader of the brigade, Paul. <laughs> so, 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 Shane, the, the audio was, um, you yeah, know, just abject failure. <clears throat> <laughs> Glenn, say what you think. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, I don't okay, know. so what, what I'm hearing is we might want to revisit this. So you didn't hear that? Couldn't hear that? I'm thinking it's more to the case that no one knew what the song was. We could not recognise a thing out of that. I couldn't hear the, the, um, the words. Oh, oh, well, they're words. Water's <laughs> dancing. <laughs> I tried this too, Glenn, but it didn't work. <laughs> but it's I a good that naturally. Um, <clears throat> what about that? How about if you just sing it, Shane? I agree. Give, give us the oh. give us the line. Give us the lyrics. Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, turn off the other mic first. We don't want the reverb. Working beautifully. Hey, Rob, how's it going? Yeah, good, thanks. <laughs> Okay, so the hey, line Rob could play is... the ukulele with this. <laughs> I saw my ex again last night, Mama, at a dance at Miller's store. How come you gotta put some entonement into it, Mama. Shane? <laughs> what was that, Michael? You gotta put some entonement, some feeling into it. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm doing my beatnik style. So. <laughs> She was with that Jackie White mama. I killed them both, and they're buried under Jenkins Sycamore. Oh, yes. yes. Platinus acerifolus. Occidentalis. So we can have a duke out for this. Um, I say Aces pseudoplatinus is most commonly. Oh, uh, come more. on. You say Aren't tomato, you? I say tomato. Um, but I have got points for Platinus, um, but Platinus orientalis is the one that's common, most commonly referred to as a sycamore from Platinus trees. I'd also accept to a lesser degree Ficus psychomorus. Ficus. Well, there you oh. go. You learn something new every day. How the so that's the end of my ten question, my nine, nine questions. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Shane. So. Thank you. What was so the score on that I'm one, I'm going to throw over to Mr. Cottle. I'll well, use the right. There you go. Hi, Shane. How you doing? Uh, yeah, look, we uh, had a lot more, we were having a lot better time last week, well, two, two weeks ago this time. Uh, we are experienced, I think, putting experience in some technical difficulties. Now, where am I? Um... So over the past few years, Moody Cadell and Partners have been a solid partner with VTIO and have been a great supporter for us as we put together activities and workshops. Um, we really appreciate their support. They are one of many businesses that are helping us to help you. Um, now, if you're in need of finance, this man's the full bottle. It's VTIO's favorite fan financier, James Cottle. <laughs> to see, with fires along the Eastern seaboard, then the COVID not lockdown, how's, how are those things affecting our industry and how are Moody Cadell and Partners supporting the good tree workers of Australia? Well, thank you very much for that introduction, Shane. That's fantastic. Um, <laughs> You'll never get one like it. Yeah. <laughs> um, look, I mean, it's, it's been a super interesting um, 12 months for the banks and uh, for, for businesses as well. Uh, you know, the banks sort of came out of a Royal Commission um, then we ran headlong into some bushfires and then straight after that into, into sort of COVID and where we find ourselves now. So it's um, been an ever-changing landscape in what we do, which is more equipment finance for ABN holders uh, and insurance as well. Um, we've, we've found the banks have sort of tightened up a little bit, but um, they've also come to the party. That they've been offering customers between sort of three and six months deferrals. Um, on their equipment finance contracts uh, through this tight period of, um, you know, where some businesses are, you know, experiencing drops in turnover and um, decrease in sort of activity out there in their market. Um, so that, that's been good. There's been good uptake on that. We've had a number of customers that we sort of assisted to get through and, um, and, and put them up for the deferrals. So uh, basically how that's working is it's, doing six months of no payments and then it's just adding to the back end of your contract. So effectively it's just, um, well, I guess like the Prime Minister said, you know, putting it all into hibernation and just kicking the can down the road. So uh, hopefully when we sort of come out of those payment deferrals, things are a bit more up and running. Sounds like for Victoria, at least we're going to be up, you know, at least in July, uh, see a bit more activity out there for everyone. So we sort of hope that it, it continues on uh, that way. So there's um, some, Offerings that the government's put out there, they're sending a fair bit of activity at the moment in the equipment finance space, at least anyway, because a lot of customers are looking to avoid paying tax this year. So uh, if they buy some assets up to about 150000 uh, they can offset uh, some of that tax, obviously, and maybe get that advice from your accountant. But um, yeah, it's been a pretty good uptake for that this year as well, even with all of this going on. So it's been a very busy 
a uh, busy little period for us. Um, but we sort of hope it continues on. Obviously, we'll have to wait and see. They're talking about at least down here the September quarter being quite a like a low point um, in terms of the broader economy. But you know, a lot of the tree guys that we're talking to, uh, you know, they've they've been ticking along. A lot of their works are fairly spread uh, among sort of you know private works, maybe some council works, and um, at least some of that market's ticked along and, and especially the private works doesn't seem to have dropped up too much for some people. Obviously, it depends who you talk to. Uh, but no, we've seen a fair bit of confidence and, and everyone seems uh, pretty happy, even in the middle of all this. So there's various things going on, a lot of changes, but um, things are sort of looking, looking good so far. Thanks, James. Uh, Sounds like we've got some positive news looking forward to look forward to. Yeah, let's head, like up. Let's, head, let's head up to um, have a chat to Barnsley and we'll get the Kahoot quiz underway. You have, have to um, this week. <laughs> you have to make me uh, co-host so I can share my screen. Radio. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Barnsley number one. But Sam, after that talk, I think uh, maybe it's time to buy a chipper. You're on mute. Definitely got to do it. <laughs> okay, Beck, you're awake. Okay, so for those of you who were around last week, you'll know that on your on the screen in front of you, the quiz will come up. You answer on your mobile phone. So on your mobile, if you go to your web browser and open kahoot.it, which is K-A-H-O-O-T dot I-T, put it in the chat, kahoot.it. And it'll ask you for a game pin. So I'll share my screen. And here we go. So this is Kahoot. So if you type in that game pin and then put in your uh, your username so you can make up, you know, a funny tree pun if you really feel the need and, and that'll be your username for, for the quiz. Um, and just some ground rules while I'm waiting for everyone to, to join. Um, oh, Mr. Prez. <laughs> Um, so there's a couple of things in Kahoot. Uh, fastest finger gets the most points, but you have to get the right answer. Um, it's multiple choice, so if you don't know the answer, have a crack anyway, because the losers don't get shown on the screen. It only shows the winners. Um, and if you're using a pseudonym, no one will know it's you anyway. Well, Amanda, we're going to know it's you. Um, well, that's uh, actually big. <laughs> to throw everybody off. There's 10 questions and sometimes there's a bit of a visual cue as well. So you keep your eye on the screen and you might, you might get a bit of a clue. Arbitrary. Um, <laughs> arbitrary. <laughs> <Love it. laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. Yes. <laughs> How's everyone going? So you got my screen on your main screen and um, you've got your, your app ready on your, on your phone. All right, let's, uh, let's play the game. So what have we got running on our phones? I've only got the um, screen on my computer. Yeah, so on the computer, the, the multiple choice question, the question and the multiple choice answers will come up on the screen and the multiple choice answers are in a colored box. And then on your phone, you just pick the corresponding color box to the right answer. So um, let's have a go. Heat, round one. Trees from around the world, are you ready? Yes. Question number one. Noted in Celtic tree law as a symbol of death, what tree is still commonly found oh. in churchyards across the UK? I know this. The yew tree. Yew. Each. No, the, no, no, the me tree. Quick, <laughs> fastest finger. Only three answers in. Oh, I'm pressing blue, but it's not working. Push it harder. <laughs> <laughs> So this has to be on the... Oh, he doesn't... He doesn't understand that it's on his phone. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a rubbish just... phone. Yeah. It's using my internet. If, yeah. I have my, if I use my phone now, my internet won't work. <laughs> Write them down, Paul. Write down oh. the answers and um, send them in. <laughs> Put them in the chat. So, of course, it is the yew tree, Taxus baccata, which is um, also poisonous if you eat the berries. So, scoreboard. Amanda, fastest in. There you go. Ah, uh, this is dodgy. Question number two. This. Located in the Sherwood Forest, what tree is said to be the resting place for Robin Hood and his merry men? General Sherman, Major Oak, Centurion, or Montezuma Cypress? 
So that's coming off my question list for next week. Oh, sorry, Shane. That's okay. <laughs> There's a picture of it there. If anyone's been lucky enough to see this tree in the Sherwood Forest, is in fact the major oak. So well done, the five of you get that one right. Let's check the leaderboard. Ah, oh, Sam. <laughs> All right, question number three. The berry from which tree is the basic common ingredient used to make gin? I'm not even going to read these out because I'm pretty sure everyone's going to get this one. There you go. I put it in there. I wrote it already. <laughs> pretty quick at typing, Paul. I know this and I don't even drink. <laughs> it is a bit of a shame. I thank you for this, Shane. Oh, someone gets to cheer about it. So it is a trick question because if you drink slow gin, um, prunus is actually um, the main ingredient for slow gin, even though it still has juniper. But juniper, of course, is the common ingredient. So let's go back to the leaderboard. Walnuts hit the lead and with Amanda on fire, not far behind. Question number four. The oldest tree in the world, a bristlecone pine, is named after which biblical patriarch? Methuselah, Enos, Noah, or Enoch. And if you'd paid attention last fortnight, you would have got that. Right. <laughs> Did you pay attention last week, Amanda? <laughs> Ooh, and the is. Yeah, I don't think many people oh. <laughs> picked up on that last week, Shay. <laughs> Oh, Mr. Prez has taken the top spot. Look at this. Here we go. Question number five. Which city has the largest population of English elms in the world? Paris, London, Manchester, or Melbourne? Another question I'm crossing off the list. We need to talk. It is Melbourne and it's due to um, what we we're talking about earlier, Dutch elm disease. Melbourne doesn't have it. They've got um, the elm leaf beetle, but they don't have the elm disease. So while uh, countries in the Northern Hemisphere had to cut down their elm trees, Melbourne got to keep theirs. So let's have a look at the leaderboard and Mr. Prez is still in the lead. Question six, the living root ridges of Meghalaya, India are made from which, the area rich of which tree? Buyong, Ginkgo, Camphor Laurel, or fig. Absolutely beautiful. And I think this is how we should build infrastructure into the future. Imagine walking across that bridge on your way to work. That's avatar engineering. <laughs> Apparently they're really good, uh, low, really low maintenance, but the construction time just takes forever. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually something they pass down in Indian culture. So yes, it's a fig and they, they teach each other how to use the aerial routes to make infrastructure. And the, um, the useful life of these figs is 500 years. So they, they expect 500 years out of the living bridge. No change to the leaderboard, but Mr. Prez is kicking along by a few thousand points there. So heading into question seven, God of the forest, Tani Mahuta, is a cowrie tree that is a remnant of the ancient subtropical forests of which country? Hawaii, New Caledonia, New Zealand, or Vanuatu? Where's my red pen? There goes another one. <laughs> see, just run it again and see who notices. It probably doesn't help that I have spent the last month studying trees around the world fairly intensely. <laughs> so you, you should be in there, Shane, and winning. Is that what you're saying? I, yeah, maybe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tiny Mahuta, of course, in New Zealand, and um, at the minute they're getting carry dieback, so um, you have to wash your boots because of um, yeah, the Phytophthora to make sure that they don't lose their, their god of the forest. Mr. Prez, ask, fire. Ask some, ask some questions. Oh. Because Amanda will get those. Sorry, I missed that, Paul. What was that? Ask some questions about underplanting of trees because Amanda will get those. Oh, maybe I'll do an ecology quiz next time. <laughs> All right, into question number eight. First uses medicine in the 15th century China. The leaves of what tree are still used to improve cognitive function? I'm not going to read this one out. You should know this one. Oh, 
Rebecca, this quiz is a dream come true. This Why isn't Juniper there? I'm pretty sure Juniper helps with cognitive <laughs> That alters cognitive function, Paul, not, not necessarily improves it. I'm pretty sure it improves yours, Shane. <laughs> for, for a while, at least. For a while. <laughs> Maybe it's um, you need some willow after you've had some juniper because that's the aspirin and then you have some ginkgo for later on. So yes, correct, ginkgo it is. Right, moving to the next question. So, oh, Amanda, come on, you, you can get there, Amanda. I want it. Oh, you know what, actually thinking about the next couple of questions, the next question is a geography based question. So you've got to know where this tree is to work out the, the answer. So question nine, the tallest trees on the planet can only survive at 100 plus meters due to the coastal mist from which ocean? <gasps> Flip, no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know, not participating but watching is a lot less pressure. <laughs> can you unpress a button? Uh, if I use my phone, my, my internet crashed before. As soon as I use my phone, it crashes. Oh. Yes, Pacific yeah. Ocean. Well, Obviously, we're that's talking specific. <laughs> we're talking about the California redwoods. So uh, the yeah. coastline off the northwest of California is the Pacific. So northwest Pacific, to be exact. <clears throat> Do we have a change? Oh. 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 Off the perch. So we're getting close, and it's the last question, and this is going to be a, a visual question as well. So if you, if you know this image, you'll know the answer. It's geography, and here we go. Question number 10. If you're walking through this avenue of baobabs, where are you likely to be? North America, New Zealand, Madagascar, or India? Oh, you asked that one well. <laughs> I had a little inflection there. <laughs> That is a good picture. Nice. Oh, you all got that one. I thought that was going to be a trick question, but here we go. Let's wrapping it up and seeing who took the top spot. Number three, nine out of ten, Sam. Oh, ripper. <laughs> nice <laughs> And in top spot with also nine out of ten, fastest finger, Mr. Fred. Yes. Good one, guys. Congratulations. Thank you, That's it. Over. Thank you, Thank Bex. So we've been hard. Actually, it came down the fastest finger, not the most correct answers. So there you go. Cool. Thanks, Beck. That was cool. Um, and there's no way I would have got close to that if I, as I said, hadn't been intently studying trees of the world in the last month. So, but there was no collusion. I want to make that clear. I think it was a bit juniper centric. Yes, I, I'm going to hone up on actually being able to actually read and become literate and actually read the question. <laughs> I'll make you picture questions next time. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Beck. Well done, Beck. Terrific. So they've been harder work in the tally room, and um, I'm happy to announce that first time player, first time winner, Rebecca James from Tasmania is the oh. owner of oh. the Moody Cadell and Partners. <laughs> First generation cap. Look, if you post it now, I should get it by Christmas. Thanks, Jane. Yeah, well, we're going to save on posting, so it might be the next time you see me hand over. <laughs> <laughs> so well done, everybody. I'm, carry a pigeon. <laughs> I'm sure we can we can smuggle it through the borders at some stage. <laughs> Thank you to Glenn, Mick, Amanda, and Beck for playing to VTO and most likely also New South Wales Arb's most favourite Barnsley for the Kahoot quiz. Sam H for making this happen. New South Wales Arb and BTO sponsors for helping us help our industry. Um, thanks to James, one of our sponsors and all of our sponsors for turning up. Um, so we're at the end of the show. And as we close, we also close the end or getting closer to the end of National Volunteer Week, the annual celebration to acknowledge the generous contribution of our nation's volunteers. In these uncertain times, the people of volunteering in Australia feel it is more important than ever to recognise and acknowledge Australia's volunteers. National Volunteer Week this year started on Monday 18 and runs to Sunday the 24th of May, so you've still got a few days out there to go and thank a volunteer. This year's theme is changing communities, changing lives. So from me to all of you volunteers out there, I say thank you very much. And whilst I'm saying that, we'll also th say thanks to all of our health and allied care workers food suppliers, petrol station operators, and all the other people who have been going to work each day so we could live our lives 
while we cocoon ourselves at home. We are living in less than usual times and no one has trained us for this and there's plenty of, there is plenty of help out there. Now, there may be some mates, some friends or far distance who need some more help than others. They don't be scared to give them a call, give them a FaceTime call, get them pushed in the direction of making the right phone call if they need to do something. So on that note, I'm going to push the stop recording button and then